exceeding. Have you ever been fishing? We are blessed to live by some of the finest fishing lakes and rivers um, to be found anywhere, I think. People drive from hours away just to come fish what we drive by every day. Um, I've decided I really don't like fishing. I like catching. <laughs> right? Perfect. Um, and one thing that we learned recently on um, we were able to do some fishing down south was that you have to have the right bait. Right? The fish are out there, but if you don't give them what they want to eat, they're not interested. Um, we had never caught a certain fish called a sheep's head because we had never fished with crab. But some guy down there tipped us off, hey, go catch the little crabs off the rock, put them on your hook, and you'll catch these fish. And you know what? It worked. Um, so I was kind of thinking about um, Matthew 419. It says, Jesus said, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So I was kind of thinking, well, what kind of bait would we use to catch men? And that just means we're to share Jesus and help them become followers of Jesus alongside us. So I thought Galatians 5.22, which is where the fruit of the Spirit is, that would be pretty good bait, right? So are you offering people love? Do they see your joy? Are you being patient with them? Are you showing them kindness? Do they see your goodness? Are you showing them your faithfulness? What about your gentleness? And are you having times of self-control? Can you pray with me? Thank you, dear Lord, for Jesus who shows us, who shows all of us that we can learn and then live your better way. In your name. This next song we're going to do has uh, actually been around for several years. I was introduced to it a little over a year ago, probably close to a year and a half. And we actually did this on Easter uh, a year ago, not this past, but last, or last year's Easter. And Wynn's been wanting to do it now for about three months. And it's called Light of That City. Some of you have heard it, some of you have not. But I think you'll enjoy it. We're going to do it for you this morning.
Bible tells me that. And I know that he's concerned about all of the things in my life. The Bible tells me that. But sometimes we forget the fact that it's that love that gives us strength. It's that love that gets us going. It's that love that even defends us in times of trouble. And this one says just that. Your love defends me. Sing it with me. Refreshing our mind, refreshing our heart. And here's a place for us to be able to do that. 
as he shares God's word, God's word promises us that it will refresh us, it'll bring us strength. Our joy comes from the Lord, and when we hear about him, it does bring refreshment into our lives. Sing this with me, it's called Refreshment. that we receive. And Father, for your touch, for your hand, for that healing hand, that comforting hand, that joyful hand, that hand that leads us and guides us. And thank you, Lord, for your presence in our life. This morning, as your word is shared, I pray that we are encouraged and that we realize even fully, God, that you are there and we can lean on you. We can trust you. We can trust your promises. We can stand on those promises that you've given us, that you will not leave us nor forsake us. God, as we come before your presence, our heart's desire is to see more of you, to sense your presence, honor and glory and praise be given to you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. Bless it this morning. In Jesus' name. some smaller fish, trout, and uh, I hear it, Bzzz, oh, my big line is going, so I'm real fast, throw that line down, and I run over, and I pick up my big rod, and just lock in, and buddy, it starts just pulling, and, and I reach over and tighten the drag a little bit, for those of y'all like myself that have never, like, fished for big fish, I never touched the drag on my reel, I had to learn what it was, the drag is what mounts, allows your reel to slip, it lets a little line off. So when it pulls real hard, it just kind of goes off, and it makes this really awesome sound. It goes, oh, I liked it. That's a pretty sound. So I tightened it up, and, man, I started just going. Oh, and I'm fighting, and you got the long rod, and, and finally I'm pulling and reeling down, pulling and reeling down, and we fight and fight and fight. And I don't know how long it goes on, but as, as the fish gets closer, and here I'm, I'm telling you, I'm just, I'm, I'm fighting, there's a fight, and I'm winning, and I'm excited about it, man, I'm just going to town, and finally it surfaces about 30 feet out, and as soon as it sees me, and I see it, so it goes out again, just ripping line off of my reel. And it's flying straight out, and I'm going, and, and I hear my brother-in-law says, make sure you got your drag right. I take that as 
you better tighten up. He's going to get away. So I tighten it up again. And I'm reeling and reeling. And by this time, I'm just manhandling this fish. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm pulling and reeling. And I'm, I mean, he tries to swim this way, and I'm pulling back. And I get a little more on it, and, and I reach down, and I finally, I crank my drag down to where there wasn't a zip left. And I'm just reeling this fish in, and, and I'm pulling and pulling it. Snap! My line breaks, and this massive fish swam away with my heart. <laughs> I'd never even seen fish that big on my line. It was something. I've caught some pretty decent catfish, but this one was shiny. <laughs> I lost it. What I found out later was that make sure your drag is set right means make sure the fish has enough drag to pull on it or he's going to ain't going to cut your line. And he did. I lost that fish. He said, well, I thought you said you caught one. I did. Losing that fish helped me understand that you had to allow the fish to wear himself out. Give him a little bit of line and let him wear himself out. And about 10 hours later, I'm fishing with a little popping cork and all of a sudden I hear, zzzz. <laughs> when I landed him, I'm not even going to show you the video, but I did this little dance thing. I think I'm half sore from it too. Oh, I was so excited. But have you ever pursued something so hard that you lost it? You know what I mean? Have you ever been to an auction? Yeah. Anybody ever seen yourself or someone else getting that bidding frenzy? You just keep going. It's like trying to catch a fish. And before you know it, you've paid more than it's worth to you. It's just too big of a cost, but you won. You see, the, the very beauty in fishing I have found is the same thing that makes it sting. It's the fact that you are pursuing something that is elusive yet obtainable. It can be caught. It's elusive, but it's obtainable. And have you ever noticed that if the more rare the fish is or, or the bigger and, and stronger and older and wiser it is, the more fight it puts up, it makes it more valuable when you get it right. Beth landed a stingray. It really wasn't that big of a fish, but you would have thought she caught a boat. I mean, she had that rod bent all the way over. It was awesome. There's something about the pursuit of it that makes it more valuable. And yet, when we over-pursue, we can snap the very line for our goals. Uh, I was interested to read here lately um, the original draft. Uh, of the Declaration of Independence, knowing that it was actually changed. Thomas uh, Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence in a rough draft. Then it went to a five-man committee who then toiled back over that draft and they brought it to the document that we know today. And probably one of the most famous lines in at least all of America. I mean, it's, it's a line that people know. It's one that if you can quote back. And the line goes like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, when I was reading uh, the original, it reads only slightly different, but it says this, is we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, that all men are created equal and independent, and that from that equal creation, they derive rights that are inerrant and inalienable. Meaning, inerrant, it has no flaw. Because that right is actually God-given, not man-written. And inalienable means that it cannot be separated from the other 
or given up or replaced. So you see, what it's saying is if God gives you something, you can't even substitute it for fries. It's, it's there. This is what you get. And in that, this idea of, of freedom that is being something that or, or liberty is something that, that we've been given by God, uh, that definition really means something interesting. It means to be able to do what you want, when you want, where you want, without any restrictions. <laughs> That's an interesting one, isn't it? Liberty, the freedom to act as you choose. Now that's a whole different sermon. I'm not going to go there except to make one good point. Y'all realize that you can't all have the same liberty unless all of you don't have some liberties? You see where that goes? I can't say, well, I want to be able to go wherever I want and not get charged with trespassing, and you have a right to have land that I don't trespass on. Right? Those are two liberties that you can't... You've you got to switch. You've got you to pick which one's going to get it. In America, you can put up a no trespassing sign. You can arrest me if I come on your land. You know if you have really beautiful farmland in England and people want to go have a picnic on it, you can't stop them? They go on it all they want. Now, there's things they can't do on it, but they have given the whole country the right to be able to enjoy that piece of property. There's very little land. You can put a no trespassing sign up there. The liberty is just different. I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. I'm just saying that you can't completely have everything you want and everybody else have it too. Amen? Y'all understand where I'm going? All right, so the next thing is the pursuit of happiness. Now, this is something that I think we need to understand that even the writers of this line did not intend on it to be used in the manner that we expect it to be today. If you have the right to pursue happiness, what happens when the things that are happy for you infringe on the things that are happy for me? Do you see where that's going? When we look at it today, much of the world reads that and says that it, I have the right to pursue a hedonistic, self-serving, self-loving, completely world-revolving-around-me kind of happiness. And anything that gets in the way is wrong because the government is responsible to protect my ability to go and pursue that completely me self-centered life. The problem is, is that the men that wrote this knew the word of God very well. And they're not going to write a line that says God has given you something that God actually tells you is bad. If you'll look in the book of 2 Timothy, this is not our key scripture today, but I would like for everybody to please read along with me. If you have a scripture, get it, mark it. Uh, this is a uh, this is important scripture. Not that they're not all important, but this is one that I think in this cultural moment we need to latch on to and understand. Second Timothy chapter three. I'm going to give you just a moment. I hear pages running, and this is one I want you to latch on to. But under, I'm oh, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Callum's back there trying to find out where I'm going. There you go, son. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud. Arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents. Kids, y'all pop up on that one. It doesn't seem like that's that big a deal until you realize how much it leads to all the rest of it. The way you learn to obey your parents today is the way you will begin life obeying God. So if you obey them just when it feels good, you're going to go on to a relationship with God where you think that's okay. All right? 
Sorry, I had to go dad there for just a moment. Disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. Anybody sing that one lightly? <laughs> Cannot be appeased. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having an appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Understand that many Americans today take the pursuit of happiness and go into a lifestyle that is just described by God in 2 Timothy as being destructive of not only your life, but of your nation. When we are more interested in getting our preferences and getting our way and getting our man and getting our position and getting our pleasure, then we are loving God then no matter how good the man or the thing you're pursuing is, it has become an idol and it is destructive in your life. So we know that these men that wrote this process, that wrote this line out, they were not giving us license to be completely hedonistic. Those of y'all kids don't know that word, it just means living life for your own pleasure. Whatever pleases me for the moment makes me happy, and therefore I am pursuing happiness. And yet if we do say, okay, these men did get this line. They did get it from inspiration from Scripture. But we need to look at the Scriptures claim to be their inspiration. Scriptures like Psalm 1611, it says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is a fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In other words, all pleasure, all joy comes from the Father. All of it. Any things that we get that are outside of the gift of God are actually some way more... Uh, it, it's what they call it when the, the virus changed, Mutated. It is the joy of God mutated into something that is no longer even carrying the value of it. A good example. Sex was given to us by God for great purpose. Okay? And it was meant to be a pleasurable and wonderful thing in the relationship that he set it to be. Yet when we morph, when we take that out of the boundaries of God and we start seeking that pleasure in ways that are not granted, not only does it devalue it, but it actually becomes destructive in the rest of life when God intended on it to be a very constructive part of your life and your marriage. Alright, so... In the right place, that pursuit of pleasure is a wonderful, God-blessed thing. Out of line, and all of a sudden, it becomes destructive. In Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. See, we've even misunderstood that one. Most of us, with a great Western view of the world that everything's progressing to get better, which, by the way, is not the way the rest of the world looks at it, we have a very different progressive way of thinking. But this idea that if you delight yourself in God, He will give you the desires of your heart. We kind of get that as some type of, if I'm good enough, God's going to give me what I want. And that's nothing to do with what that scripture says. What that scripture says is, is if you find joy in what God finds joyful, if you delight in what He delights in, if you find your life centered and joyful in Him, then He will actually plant in your heart the desires that you need. God will give you the desires of your heart. That's even better. That's what people don't get. It's even better that God gives you the desires and you get those fulfilled than you get to make up your own and get those fulfilled. I mean, it's so much better when God puts something in there and you walk away saying, I won. Oh, I promise you, it's so much better. Last verse I'll read, John 15, 11 says, 
these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be made, my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full, or that your joy may be complete, inerrant, even, without flaw, and completely unseparable. You can't take it out and put it somewhere, say, oh, I'm going to take this part of it, and I'm going to refuse that part. No, God says that the, my joy in your life can be made complete. I don't know about y'all, but I love some complete joy. You know what I mean? Oh, but the me keeps getting in the way. The Bible says it is for freedom that Christ set us free. And it is a joyful and happy, happy thing. But, there's always a but, right? But here on earth, God never promised you that you'd always be happy. In fact, the Declaration of Independence doesn't even promise you happiness. It only says you can pursue it. Fish away. You may catch it. And we're going to somehow try to pursue the right or 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 protect the right for you to pursue happiness. And yet at the same time, it never promised you that it will happen. In fact, listen to me, and let's make this point stick. You can do everything right. Everything. And things can still go completely wrong in your life. You can honor God. You can try to live a perfect life. You can eat healthy and still get sick. You can do everything the doctor tells you to do and still not get well. You can do everything your boss ever asked you to do and then some and you can still be fired. And you can go and protect yourself all you want with all the right insurance and everything and still lose it all. And it's not necessarily an evil thing. It's just what God is using to shape you and bring you to a joy that is complete and full. And that requires you in some way to have the blessings that only come through suffering. There are some things in life you just can't inherit. You've got to earn them. think maybe this year we're seeing a little more of that, but we as a church shouldn't all be that shocked. I'm pretty sure he laid it out for us pretty simple. In this life, you will have struggles. Not may, will. The joy of the Lord is supposed to be, excuse me, I believe when our greatest struggles are that the joy of the Lord is supposed to be our goal, and yet, even in the life of a normal Christian, we often find ourselves pursuing happiness that is not necessarily how God has laid it out for us. Sometimes it's even pursuing good things, but it is not pursuing good things the way that God has asked us to do it. Sometimes it's pursuing something that is good in your life, but pursuing it so hard that you overbid. Pursuing it in such a way that it infringes on somebody else and, and all of a sudden what was just a desire in my life turns into this strong goal in my life where I have to have it, I have to win. I can't be happy unless I get there. I have the right to pursue my happiness. Therefore, in pursuing happiness, I'm just going to keep charging until I get it and you just... Find out that, oh, well, for me to do this, i got to compete with you to get the right funds or to have the right power or to have my way over your way. And the competition from person to person gets stronger and stronger because we all are starting to see these desires in our life as needs, as requirements, as things that are protected by God that we ought to have the right to have. And, and, and you get through this feeling that you're being infringed on and you fight harder and you see somebody that seems to be an enemy that's coming against you for that one thing and you just crank the drag down a little bit more and start manhandling. And my daddy's bigger than your daddy and my person's bigger than your person. And before you know it, 
It's that. And we actually lose the very happiness we're trying to get to. Can you follow me on just this one tangent? Bob, because I just like using the name Bob, he doesn't agree with you politically. You know, in fact, every person you vote for, he hates. Hates them. Bob likes to go online and talk about how much he hates them. In fact, Bob has even gone online and talked about how much he hates the fact that you don't hate them. And Bob doesn't really even believe in your God, so you can quote the Bible to you all he wants, and Bob just looks at it as a crutch that's a problem in your life, not a problem in his life, and think something that he is more elevated in his way of thinking. And, and Bob desperately wants to see everything that you stand for fall. When we fight Bob, how do we fight him? Do you tighten the drag a little bit more? You pick up the keyboard, give Bob your two cents worth. You know why they call it a two cents worth? Because it's not worth much. And we go in and we fight and we fight and we fight. But there was something that really could have happened. You see, Bob is actually a child of God. That his sins have been paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. Bob is actually going to turn out to be one of the strongest giving Christians that his church has ever seen. But Bob's not scheduled to get there for a few more years. And the only thing between Bob and Jesus is you. How important is it that we pursue happiness within the boundaries that God has given us. Say, set your drag. Say it. Say, set your drag. Set your drag. Something that I think I need to be told more often in life. I'm going to give you a verse that I thought when I'm sitting there looking and say, God, please help me. What is it? What do I do when you got one, you got to deal with him, you're already... In the tangle. You know what I mean? Fish on. How do I uh, live a life? How do I pursue this person in a way that sets the drag in a sense that allows me to do what I'm supposed to do and God to do what God's supposed to do and the boundaries stay right and if God's going to save them, God's going to save them and I'm not going to be in the way and praise God if there's any chance I get to be a part of it. Amen? Amen. Turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Romans, chapter 12. Start in verse 14. Now, I want you to know I'm about to wrap up, okay? Last scripture I'm going to be reading for the day. Uh, but it's a doozy. All right? Set your drag. Tell me back. Say, set your drag. Set your drag. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. I think it's interesting you have to tell us that one twice. That does not, by the way, mean say bless your heart after you say what you want to say in Bible. Okay? Just thought I would go ahead and relieve you all from that southern issue there. You are not allowed to curse someone and then say bless their heart and it'd be okay. Bless your heart. Uh, bless those who persecute you and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Preached on that last week. Different verse, same thing. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Let that one marinate for a moment. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. 
What that implies is, is that if you do not associate with the lowly, you are being haughty. Okay? That's not a but. I mean, that's not an and. That's a but. Y'all got that? All right. We'll let that one marinate a little bit. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. I like to give people my humble yet accurate opinion. <laughs> Come on. Y'all know that's funnier than you want it to be because you know you do the same thing. I just said it. That's all. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Folks, let me go ahead and give you an idea here. Honorable in the sight of all does not mean right in the sight of all. It means honorable. You can do something that people hate in a way that is still honorable. They can be offended all they want. Are you being honorable in what you are doing? If at all possible, which does imply there are times when it's not, if at all possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Can't we all just get along? No, we can't. But as it pertains to you, you don't really get an option. That's part of setting the drag. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. Let me give you a old. By the way, there is absolutely nothing you can do that is as vengeful as hell. I mean, we've had some conversations. I've heard about some of the stuff goes down Tennessee Parish. Didn't like what so and so did. What was it? A, a box of roofing tacks on the gravel road going to their house? That's just wrong, folks. That's vengeful. I've had those kind of thoughts. I call it my redneck nature. Don't know what I mean? I can be good. I can be creative. I could probably be creative and not get caught. And God says, don't avenge yourself. Let me do it. I promise you, and nothing you come up with anywhere near as bad as the vengeance of God. But it could very well get in the way of the mercy of God. Church, have we become so nearsighted that we are blind to the fact that we ourselves were that wretched soul. So I was never that bad. And you just don't know yourself very well. Don't become so nearsighted that you forget you desperately need a Savior too. So don't be vengeful. Vengeance is mine and I will replace, says the Lord. To the contrary, if you will, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And do not overcome evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's easy. It's easy for us to pursue our own passions, our own happiness, so much so that we just make the cost more than we ever wanted to pay. But that's sin. It's its job. Sin will always take you farther than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and make you pay more than you were willing to pay. That's what it was there for. That's what Satan's attacking you with. But as for you and me, set the drag. Become fishers of men in a way that the world is blessed by you.
Father God, thank you. Thank you for the ones we lose and the ones we catch to remind us that we need to be gentle, patient, loving, kind, charitable, forgiving. And then we come to all things to all people that by all means we might save some. And in this time of great darkness, help us be a light. A light like a city on a hill. That the world around us sees our good works and praises you, not us. Not our party. Not our politics. Not our church. Lord, they praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand with me, please? Time of refreshing. Let's sing that again.